Okay, this is Phil Simberg at USBDF, and here's a position that one of my students uh, uh, sent me just yesterday and asked me how to analyze this over the board. It's a two-backing problem. It's a match to 11, and blue is leading 6 to 1 and is on roll. Uh, now, I'm sure there's a quiz factor here. Uh, this is the position that looks like a huge double in pass, and of course it is for money, and it is at most normal scores, but a flag has to go up when you're losing 6 to 1. That suggests that maybe there's a chance that red might have a take here, and of course it may not even be a double at such a high score. So you've got to think about these things. Now, the first thing I did was try to come up with my own method of seeing uh, the, what the cube action is, and I actually did a fairly good job, but I missed a few uh, technical things, and I, I wasn't entirely right. And uh, I thought that my student uh, who's paying good money for lessons is entitled to a lot more help uh, and more definitive help. So in these kinds of positions, I always turn to uh, my guru when it comes to the cube, and one of the best in the world, John O'Hagan, who's with us today. Say hello, John. Hello. Okay, so John is a is a giant, uh, ranked 13 or 11, somewhere in that range. He's coming second in Monte Carlo, won many, many tournaments. And when I started teaching professionally, one of the first things I did is I brought on some good help with Perry and uh, Stick and John O'Hagan to help me. And then David Rockwell has been providing additional uh, research help. He doesn't directly teach. But nobody's better than this at John. And before we uh, hear John's take and how he would approach this over the board, uh, I want you to pause the recording. You can just hit the pause button and stop and think about how you would approach it. Think about what you would do. And then you can continue the re recording and hear how one of the best in the world would approach this to come up with hopefully the, the right answer about the cube action here. So go ahead and pause your computer and we'll wait for you for just a second. I know that some of our students are, are a very high level. Some of the people who are watching the video are very high level and should be able to work this out. And most of you, I'm sure, will have problems. Okay, I assume you're back now after pausing the video. I want to tell you just a quick, brief overview, a 10,000 feet overview, and then I'm going to let John get into the details. We all know that when you're thinking about doubling or thinking about taking the cube, the first thing you need to know is your take point. And the second thing you need to know is whether or not you have a recube anytime soon, what kind of recube bigger power you have, whether it's a dead cube or a live cube, and whether you're likely to return the cube. And then the third thing you need to know is what your odds are in this particular position so that you can see if you're higher or lower than your take point. Well, I, that's the right approach in these kinds of positions, and that doesn't matter whether you're blue and giving the cube or red and taking the cube. You have to work out those things. So in these kinds of positions, I find both of those things kind of very difficult to do over the board, but John will tell us the right way to do it, but the one of the most wonderful things about working with John is he's practical. In addition to coming up with the right way to do it, he often has some ideas or shortcuts or flags uh, that will get you there maybe a little bit sooner than doing doing it the hard way, but sometimes they just take the hard way. So I'm going to shut up now and let's listen to John's approach to this cube. Okay, um, so I think the way I would approach it is um, I would ask, you know, using the Woolsey rule, am I sure that red has a take? And uh, in order to answer that, you need to really buckle down and figure out uh, uh, his match winning chances if he will drop, and then uh, whether or not he should redouble to eight if he gets another roll in this game. Uh, so in, in order to answer the question of does Red have a take or not on the poor cube, you need to um, ask, say that blue rolls a non-double, it bears off two men off the two pole. In the resulting position with red on roll owning a four cube, should red redouble to eight? Because you need to answer that so you'll know how much he gains. Does he gain four points when he win, wins this game, or does he win eight points when he wins this game? So to answer that question, um, the uh, way you do it is as follows. If um, red has taken this four cube and blue say rolls a six five, for example, there's two men off the two points. 
Red now on roll, should he redouble to eight? Um, if he does not redouble and he loses this game, he'll be down 10 to 1 profit with about 4% match winning chance. If he does redouble to eight and loses this game, he will lose the match with 0% match winning chances. So his risk from redoubling to eight is 4%. Um, as far as the gain side, if he holds the cube at four and wins this game, he will win four points, which will make the score five to six uh, to 11, which is about 43% of the trailer. Whereas if he does redouble to eight and wins this game, he'll be ahead nine to six, which is about 74% match winning chances. So the risk, as we um, found earlier, is 4%. And the gain is the difference between 43 and 74, which is 31%. So risk divided by risk plus gain is 4 over 35. So in other words, that's about 1 now. 4 over 36 will be 1 now. It's a little higher than that. So if Red's chances are greater than one in nine, uh, it's correct to redouble. And here, he would have five chances out of 36 to uh, roll double twos or higher. So it would be a correct redouble. So with that in mind, uh, we then uh, know that if Red gets another chance, the correct cube action is to redouble to eight. So now let's see if he should take this four cube. Uh, if he drops, he's down 8 to 1 to 11. And um, so in other words, he's 10 away, 3 away. And at scores like this, I always use a Neil's number kind of an approach. And when the trailer is 10 away, Neil's number is 5 and a half. What that means uh, is... Let me, let, me, let me just show you Neil's number because I use it too. And this is a chart of Neil's numbers. Uh, it's a shortcut that gets you close to what your match equity is at any given score. So with this chart, it tells you uh, that when someone is 10 away, you take the difference of the score and you multiply that difference times 5.5. And then you either add or subtract that to or from 50% to see each side's winning chances. And rather than memorizing every single possible match equity, from zero, zero to 15 away, 15 away, uh, and so on, which very few people in the world can do, this shortcut will get you there much easier and quicker, as long as you can memorize this list of numbers. And it's not that hard. I Even a guy like me has memorized these numbers now. Okay, John, go ahead. Yeah, and um, it will not be 100% accurate, but it's it'll get you close, which is really about all you can expect. So anyway, with the uh, Neil's number being five and a half, um, that means that the trailer's winning chances are 50% minus seven times five and a half. Okay, so seven times five and a half is uh, 38 and a half. So that means if uh, the trailer were to pass, it'd be down eight to one, which is about 11 and a half percent match winning chances. Uh, if he takes and loses, we already know he would redouble to eight. Uh, so that means he will lose the match with 0%. However, there, there is a small other little angle here, too, in that uh, if blue redoubles to 4 and red takes, if blue rolls double 2s or higher, blue will just win. So you won't redouble to 8. Okay? But uh, to keep things simple over the board, um, I would just sort of keep that little sequence in the back of my mind. And if the decision is otherwise very close, I would have to factor that in. Okay, well, isn't, now, there, isn't there another factor you keep in the back of your mind? What if blue rolls two ones in a row? Okay, I'll get that in a second. Here. Oh, okay. Go ahead. And then, um, so for now, anyway, we're going to say if uh, red passes, his match winning chances are 11.5%. Take and lose zero, even though we know it's actually a little bit better than that. For now, we'll just say zero. And if he takes and wins, he's going to win eight points. So he'll be ahead nine to six, which is about 74% match winning chances. So um, the take point for red is then about 11 and a half divided by 74, which is a little over 15%. Okay. And as I said earlier, it's actually a little bit lower because if uh, blue rolls one of those five 
good doubles on his first roll, you won't lose the match. You'll be down 10 to 1 with about 4% match winning point. Okay, but that only happens on five of his wins. All the other wins, you lose the match. So, kind of a minor point, but we'll get to that later. If it is otherwise close, we'll want to factor that in. Okay? So, uh, we think the take point's a little over 15%. Okay? So, next question is, how often does red win this position? Okay? And uh, really, there are only two sequences. Um, number one, blue rolls one of the 31 non-doubles, and red then rolls one of the five good doubles. Okay, so that's 31 times 5, which is 155 over 1296. That's, uh, 31 divided by 36 times 5 divided by 36. So that's 155. And the second sequence is um, blue rolls a single eighth, and uh, red rolls a non-double, and then blue rolls a, an ace again and loses. Okay. And so how often does that happen? Uh, blue rolls a single ace 10 over 36. Blue and the reason, by the way, we're, yeah, the reason it's 10 instead of 11 is because double ones uh, will still work for blue. Right, exactly. So they, uh, a single ace is 10 over 36. A non-winner for blue occurs 31 out of 36. So that's uh, 310 divided by Ninety-six, and then blue has to roll a single ace again, which happens about twenty-eight percent of the time. So, in other words, that's about another eighty-eight over twelve ninety-six. That's uh, because twenty-eight percent of three ten is about eighty-eight. Okay, uh, thirty percent of three ten would be thirty-one. What well, would be ninety-three? I'm sorry. So it's a bit less than thirty percent. So that's that's how I come up with eighty-eight. So the total chances of uh, Red winning um, is 155 plus 88, which is 243 over 1296. Okay? So in terms of percentages, 1296, notice that 130 is about 10% of 1296. Okay? So in other words, 260 would be 20%. Right? And here we're at 243. So we're uh, a little less than 19%. So therefore, we know that uh, red should take because even if, even though we know we overestimated his take point as a little over 15 percent, he actually wins almost 19 percent. Okay, and we know his true take point because of the thing that if blue rolls a double twos or higher on its first roll, um, that uh, red doesn't lose the match. He's close to it, but he still has about 4% match winning chances. So um, we know that uh, Red's take point is a bit less than 15%, and he wins almost 19%. So it's certainly a take. Okay, let me ask you some questions that add some comments, uh, and uh, maybe we can simplify this some, because what you did is something that I think very few people in the world could do over the board. My first question is, is this exactly how you would do it over the board? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. This is your approach. So uh, it took you, what, about uh, seven, eight minutes to do this. Would it take you that long over the board, or does it take you longer when you're explaining it to us like this? Um, that's about how long it would take over the board. Okay. So if you're playing with the clock, you're going to have to use up about seven or eight minutes of your time uh, over the board to make this cube decision. Yes, and, and, but, and, and I mean, this is an important decision in a match, talking about a four or an eight cube. Yeah, well worth it, taking the time. Yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. And you might rush yourself a little bit more with the yeah. top level, and you might yeah, take absolutely. a few I mean, more, you might round off some numbers and shorten yeah. up a little bit. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I mean, if I'm low on time, I would just have to do a, uh, you know, my sort of first impression would be, would, would be a redouble take. Okay. Now the next thing we're going to do is check John's work, and then I'm going to get into a few other things that John uh, talked about and some that were alluded to, and then I'm going to tell you how I did this over the board. I would have gotten this right over the board, but nowhere near as accurately. And part of the reason I got it right was some luck, because a couple of the things I did, as I mentioned, I didn't do exactly right. But 
if I had taken the time, I'm going to be very honest with you about this, is one of the reasons why John is one of the top players in the world, and I'm not. I'm a very good player, but the, this is a, a real classic example of the difference between a John O'Hagan and a Phil Simborg. I would estimate and come up with some methodology to give me a pretty good clue as to what to do here, while John will get it right. And the difference is going to be when it's not close, we're probably both going to get it right. And when it's close, he's going to get it right a lot more often than I will. First of all, let's make sure he's right. Let's hit the button. And you're going to see that Extreme Gaming says it's a pretty big mistake to drop. It's a 15% error to drop. As John said, the winning chances are a little bit under 19%. This is cubeless, but cubeless is really what's going to be involved here because this game is going to be played out to the end. The cube is not going to end this game because certainly after blue t after red takes uh, yeah, and he, if red redoubles even if blue rolled a one blue is taking so the cubeless is very accurate here as far as the take point goes let's take a look at what extreme gambling says about the take point it says that the take point for red if it was a dead cube and he never had an opportunity to re cube is 22.5. And you can get this using risk over risk plus reward. How do you get to a live cube take point? And why is Extreme Gaming's live cube take point around 13 and John figured 50? Can you explain that, John? Well, I, actually, I said it'd be a bit under 15. And um, yeah, a couple of reasons. Number one, um, the uh, Neil's number is a little bit off at the score of three away, 10 away. Using the Neil's number approach that I use, you get 11 and a half. Whereas with uh, Extreme Gamut's actual uh, match winning chance formula, it uh, gives you, I think, close to 13. So it's a little bit off on that. I got uh, you. And the, the other thing is that uh, the actual take point formula for the trailer is if he drops, he's, uh, like I said, uh, trailing uh, 10 away, 3 away. And I was using 11 and a half, and it's actually close to 13. So, you know, that's going to cause part of the problem. The, the other thing is, if he takes and loses, um, and altogether he loses about 29 games out of 36, okay? Now, five of those 29 losses are when uh, blue rolls an immediate double. So, in other words, on about one-sixth of your losses, you don't lose the match right away. You're 4%. Okay, so the um, formula then is if you pass, you're actually, I was using 11 and a half percent, you're actually about 13 percent. Take and lose, you're about two thirds of one percent. Take and win, you're about 74. So that's going to uh, make the take point a bit lower than what I said. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next question I have for you, John, is you did an incredibly good job of re analyzing red's position and again i like that you started it with that if you assume you're blue you still have to decide if you're going to use Woolsey's law which you should do uh every single time you're thinking about doubling the first question is what is my opponent going to do is he dropping if he's dropping i'm going to be doubling unless he did the double if i'm not quite sure if he's taking or dropping then for sure it's a double according to Woolsey's law and that's generally true and if he's taking then you have other questions to ask. So John did a great job to determine that Red is not only taking, he's repeating, uh, no matter what blue rolls, unless blue rolls double, blue doesn't have a chance to repeat. How did you then conclude that blue had a double? Yeah, actually I uh, didn't even uh, explain that. So uh, basically in a uh, position like this, where you have a big lead in the score, which blue does here, uh, you want to, uh, really think long and hard about uh, should you redouble the four. And uh, basically what you want to look at here is uh, your doubling window. Okay. And uh, well, when let's you, define, let's, let's say what it, what is a doubling window? What does that mean? Well, in a money game, a doubling window is 50 to about 78% in a uh, gammonless position. Okay. So in other words, when does your uh, window open? for the lowest possible winning chance you could have where you might have a redouble. And, 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 I'm, and I'm pointing to the doubling window right here according to Extreme Gaming for this position. Let's see. He calls, uh, he calls it double point. Okay. So 56% uh, if it's uh, just a case where you're redoubling to four and the opponent can never redouble to eight. And uh, what is it? So 12 point something percent? 
uh, hold it. I, I have a hard time reading that. So 82.62 percent. If it's a live view. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. So and that's the that's the, the at that point you've lost your market if he's over 82.62 percent, and here it's right before that point. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so basically. Um, in this position, though, that first figure of the 56% doesn't really apply because, for the most part, uh, you're going to be talking about an 8 cube, not a 4 cube, because the opponent will always redouble to 8 if you get the chance, which is what happens in you know vast majority of the time. So uh, basically, the uh, minimum redoubling point using X extreme gamma actual numbers uh, is about 76.5%, and then the um, um, the other end of the window is the number you just showed, the 82 point something percent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And so you're you're real close to that, and also the game's almost over, uh, so, which is another reason to uh, double. So okay. you're basically okay. close enough to the high. Now, in in a live tournament, you can't take out a pencil and a paper and a calculator and say, well, let's see, if I don't redouble, these, these are my next winning chances. If I do redouble, uh, you know, this is the uh, yeah, it's all going to be done in your head. Like um, you just. So in in this case, I would just say, look, I'm close enough to the high end of the of the window. The game's almost over, uh, and some people will drop. Uh, so it's got to be a redouble. Okay, there's another major reason you must redouble, and that is you're going to get lots of drops. If you yeah. use Wolsey's law here, and you say, should I should I take or drop? Even if you come to the conclusion that you're sure you can take that you're sure you should take this cube and redouble, you must at least come up with the idea that many people will drop this cube and they're going to steal two points. And when you do, your opponent has made a 15% error. And any time your opponent makes an error, that increases your match equity. That's just a, a given. You want to make it hard for him. If you don't redouble here, you don't make it hard for him at all. He has no problem. You give them a real problem when you read the whole, and that's the problem that most of us have here. Should we be taking this cube? Now, let me tell you my approach to this, and I'll tell you why I don't use John's approach. First of all, I'm not real good at, mo at dividing things by 1296. John showed you when he did it how he uh, he rounded off and he said that 130 is about uh, a 10 percent and so on. And, and if you get in the habit of doing it, it really isn't brain surgery. It isn't that hard. You don't have to be a mathematical genius to do these kinds of things because there's too many really top players out there who are not mathematical geniuses that have just with enough practice learn how to do these things. But even I would say that if you take the top 32 players in the world, the Giants, I would say maybe half of them at the most would go to, into this detail uh, and use John's uh, very, very accurate and correct methodology. Would you sort of agree with that, John? Um, I think you're about right, yeah. Okay, about half. So, who knows? But a bunch of very, very top players uh, would estimate this without getting into it just by feel, because this really isn't that close. You're, the difference between a take and a drop here is pretty big, and it shouldn't take that long, and that's how I came to the right conclusion, but let me tell you how I did it. I use reference positions, and, uh, and so do many top players. I happen to know that a two-roll, two-roll position is about 14% for the take. That's the odds. If this was a two-roll, two-roll position, and I'll hit the button and prove to you that I'm right, if blue were to double here, the odds of red winning, and he only wins when blue doesn't roll a double, and he does, is about 14%. And I know that this position that we were looking at originally, Hit control V and put it back. It's got to be slightly better than that because of the chance of red, a uh, blue rolling two ones in a row. So uh, what I did wrong was I said, well, the odds of rolling one one, uh, one one is 1036, and two in a row is 1036 times 1036, and that's 28%. That's 28%, around 8%. Except what I forgot and what John pointed out is that sometimes he doesn't get to roll the second one because sometimes red actually rolls doubles so that blue doesn't roll the second one. So I backed in a little bit too much uh, for that. But I still was able to come up with that I knew that red wins this game more than 14%. So all I had to do was see if I could come up with a take point that was less than 14%, and, and then it would be right. Now, my experience tells me that if I'm way behind in the match and I'm looking at a 4 cube, 
especially if I can recube the eight, that my take points are often very, very low. I've seen take points of four and three percent and six percent and eight percent. So that's why my flag went up that this might well be a take. And I actually did use Neil's numbers and I came up with the right decision that I would take this cube. Here's where I had a real problem though. I didn't know if I would have a redouble if he doesn't roll a one. I wasn't sure after blue just took two checkers off if I'm still redoubling. That was where I was getting into real difficulty in the calculations. I knew if he rolled a one, it's a no-brainer that I redouble it. But if he didn't roll the one, I really wasn't quite that sure. And that's where you really have to be able to do the kind of math that John does. And again, that separates the men from the boys or the Johns from the Phils in these kinds of positions. Now, for those of you who are depressed because you think you might have to be able to do that kind of math and to become that good to be a top player, uh, rather than be depressed, you should be motivated. What I did when I first had conversations like this with John several years ago, and even before that, I was taking lessons from, from Kit, who was also incredibly mathematical, and he's one of the giants that I would uh, know would actually do the math over the board just like John does. I, I got very depressed about it, and I just started saying, oh, well, I'm just not going to be that good. I'm just going to estimate these things and hope for the best and hope they don't come up that often and hope I get them right. And that's what I did for many years, and sometimes I was right, and sometimes I was wrong, and that's why I was a 7.0, an 8.0, a 9.0 player. And now I'm a little better than that uh, as a result of sharpening the pencil and other things. But something else happened to me. I, I spent a weekend with our Benjamin, who is the, the guy who wrote uh, The Secrets of Mental Math and Math Magic, and he inspired me to he autograph this book for me, The Secrets of Mental Math, and I started reading it, and I started finding out that multiplying and dividing by three-digit numbers is really not that complicated. A lot of it is based on doing what John does. You round things off, you estimate things, and you come pretty close, and that can make you a very, very top player, and it should be able to get you to the right decision. So even though I was wrong in the methodology and didn't quite get it right, I was able to come up and would have, over the board, come up with the right cube decision in this position. But it's tricky. It isn't that easy. Let me just show you how complicated this can get. Let's reduce Blue's score by one point. And now he's leading five to one. And I'm not going to go through all the math. This is now a pass. It went from a take to a pass. When you do the numbers, you won't quite have enough to, pass, to take. Now, if you do it wrong, you're only making a 2% error. So you can't make too big an error here. But let's go the other way now. Let's pretend that blue had seven points instead of six. In this case, it would be a big mistake, a huge mistake to redouble. Because when you do the numbers and you do the risk and the rewards of just winning two points at this score, as opposed to risking eight points at this score, it would be a terrible redouble. How many players in the world and how quickly over the board are you gonna get this right by just making quick estimates like I did? The only way I think you're gonna get these things right is to go through the numbers and practice going through the numbers. And if you do it enough, and you do it and think about it enough, it gets easier and easier, and you'll get better and better at it. Um, if anybody who's watching this video has any different questions or comments on the USBGF site underneath the video, you can post your questions. Uh, you can email me or John, uh, and most of you have my email address, and you've posted all over the Facebook page. And uh, I want to thank John very much. Uh, John, do you have anything else to add about these positions? Uh, one, one of the last comment. Um, all of this is based on the assumption that these are two even players, uh, which sometimes is the case, sometimes is not the case. So um, it's a no-skill position. So um, if one player or the other is a lot better or worse than the other, that could change things. But uh, we're basing this on two uh -huh. even players. Well, I'll show you exactly where it changes things. At the score that I told you it was a 2% error to drop, I'm sorry, that's going the other way. At this score, it's a 2% error to pass. If your name is Phil Simborg and you're playing John O'Hagan, it's right to take this cube. Right. Or if your name is if your name is Mr. So-and-so and you're playing Mochi or, or one of the top players in the world, you can easily be right. To, in fact, you should take this cube even though it's a 2% error to drop it. It's your best shot at getting back in the match against a player who's going to outplay you the rest of the match anyway. And it, like John says, it's a no-skill position. Nobody's going to misplay the checkers here. So uh, in these kind of positions, what I have seen 
is the better player making huge mistakes and not double. But I, I, one of the things I've always admired about Falafel, and I've played him a few times, is even though it's a small double and he knows he's a much better player, he's still trying to do the technically correct thing and, and, and give the cube anyway. He doesn't play the opponent that much. Some people criticize that. Some people say he should. And uh, it's a double-edged sword. But John's point is that, that you do have the human factor. I pointed it out earlier, and that's another reason that you double because you might get a drop. Well, this is another reason to take if you're the poorer player. Now, if you are the much better player in your red here, it would be a very big mistake to drop. You want the match to last as long as possible. You want to play as many games out as possible. And you don't want to be looking at an eight cube in a, in a low score position. Um, okay, John, thank you very much. This was a very enlightening analysis. We've done many like this over the years. Um, thanks to the USBGF for making this format possible. And uh, we will see you again uh, soon with other uh, uh, positions and, and upcoming tournaments. Okay. Uh,